It's a really great pleasure to introduce you here to this session. Um, it's being uh, organised by a number of the partners of Sanitation and Water for All, SWA. So we're a partnership of over 90 uh, governments, development partners, donors, civil society, private sector, research and learning institutes. We've, really, we've come together as a partnership. We've been running for about six years now. Um, and we've been growing as a partnership. You might know us best for our political process, uh, the fact that we, um, we have a series of, uh, we have a, a process where governments make commitments to improve their sanitation, water and hygiene situation. They, they work together in country across the, the different stakeholders to develop partnerships and then bring these to a high level meeting at the World Bank, a meeting of ministers of finance every second year. There have been three of those so far. And then there's a follow-up process and a review process. So that's one of the aspects of sanitation and water for all's work. But a lot of what we're about is strengthening national systems. And it's a real pleasure to invite you here this afternoon to talk about changing behaviours to build systems that last. And this is part of SWA's evolving strategy. So just to give you uh, a little bit of... Uh, an idea of what's going to happen this afternoon. I'm going to call on our executive chair, Katrina de Albuquerque, to give you a short introduction and let you know how the partnership's been evolving and some of our new thinking about our strategy and what we'll be doing uh, in the next uh, months and years. And then we've been doing a lot of work on behaviours and how should we as people involved in this effort to improve sanitation and water and hygiene, how should we be behaving? And I'm going to ask our colleague, Heather Skilling, from USAID to, to talk to us about that. And then we're very glad to have some of our partners from countries to come and talk to us about what, what happens in their countries, what the reality is in their countries. Um, we've got a few people who are going to give us some insights into that, and then there'll be a chance for discussion. So, I think we've got a lot to cover, but we're excited to be doing that. And then at the end, I'll, I'll call on my colleague, Everest, from UNICEF to talk about what's sort of coming next for SWA. So the event is being live streamed, so there's the opportunity also for people to be joining uh, via the internet. If you want to tweet about what we're saying, then you can use at SanWatForAll, and you can also use the World Water Week uh, hashtag. Um, and as I said, the main thing is that we want to have a discussion and we want to talk about what really happens in countries and how development partners work together. When I say development partners, I mean everyone involved in development. But first, let's hear from Katrina de Albuquerque. Um, thank you, Amanda. Uh, Minister uh, Lompo, uh, Minister of Agriculture, Water Resources, Sanitation and Food Security of Burkina Faso, Honorable uh, uh, Joanita uh, Ndaihi Mananjara, Minister of Water, Hygiene and Sanitation of Madag Madagascar, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear partners, dear friends. Welcome to the Sanitation and Water for All side event, Changing Behaviors to Build Systems That Last, SWA's uh, Evolving uh, Strategy. As many of you will already know, I'm very proud to be the not-so-new executive chair of Sanitation and Water for All Partnership. And this is my first World Water Week in this new role. It has, of course, been quite a change for me. Uh, as some of you might know, I was previously the UN Special Rapporteur uh, on the human rights uh, to water and sanitation. Uh, and my work uh, with SWA uh, has given me the chance to embrace a broader role in the wash sector and yet to continue my mission to ensure that the human right to water and sanitation is fulfilled for everyone and everywhere, meaning that access to water and sanitation is available um, to everyone regardless of who they are, where and how they live, to ensure universal access to water 
water and sanitation through the elimination of inequalities. These are all issues that are, uh, that are um, an integral part of the work and of the daily discussions we have at SWA uh, with our dear partners. So, I am here to tell you about the SWA partnership evolving strategy. It builds on our original um, uh, 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 strategy and on our original vision of sanitation, water and hygiene for all, always and everywhere. That will not change. Uh, the difference is, uh, please uh, bear with me, I don't want to be pretentious, but I think we were a bit ahead of time because we had already before the SDGs the vision of the SDGs. Um, and, and of course, now we don't need to change that vision because it matches the SDGs. How, uh, and, um, However, when we were created, as I was saying, during the period of the MDGs, um, we uh, were created to assist those countries that were most off track in terms of meeting the Millennium Development Goals. And through dialogue with the, the different ministries, um, the finance ministries and donors, we were searching for specific solutions. Now, at the end of the summer of 2015, as the MDGs reach their end date and the new framework of the Sustainable Development Goals is becoming clearer, we can see that there is a significant uh, 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 change in approach, particularly for our wash sector. The SDGs, unlike the MDGs, are no longer talking about reducing the number of people without access. They are talking about universal access. And thus are absolutely, as I said, in line with SWA's vision. Not only is there a standalone goal, but the human rights to water and sanitation have got a special mention. And you might know that water and sanitation is the only human right besides gender inequality uh, that is explicitly mentioned in the outcome um, uh, document. And there is very specific language throughout the SDGs on gender equality, on reduction of inequalities uh, 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 general, all issues that SWA has to take and is taking account of. The SDGs have introduced the pretty revolutionary idea that no goal or target should be considered met unless it is met for all social and economic groups. Um, and at SWA, we had already uh, last year in our last uh, high-level meeting decided to focus on this idea of the elimination of inequalities. How do we approach this uh, and how do we ensure it? There is also a significant change in emphasis in that the primary responsibility to realize, to make sure the SDGs becomes, become a, a reality lies at country level. While the international community has obviously to step in and support those country, who, countries whose resources are not enough to realize the SDGs for all. With this in mind, the SWA Steering Committee, which is our governing body, representing the partnership, approved the main features of its new strategy last, no, 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 it was before the holidays in June, um, to adapt to this changing context. We will continue to prioritize countries still dependent on donor support, while also looking at middle and higher income countries where there are still many people without uh, access to adequate water, sanitation and hygiene. And we will continue to coordinate with a wider group of actors, including the private sector and civil society. The new strategy outlines our vision, our role and purpose, and a set of objectives. We also realize that we would need to make certain changes to our membership and governance if we were to implement this strategy. And if we were to respond adequately to the challenge posed to us by the SDGs, not only to the challenge, but to the vision and to the call from the, uh, by, uh, 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 by the SDGs. So for example, we are actively reaching out to any UN member state to make sure they join SWA. We started a, a partnership drive uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we are in contact with, with many countries and as I was saying, from regions that we weren't targeting before, namely Latin America, for example, but also middle income, other middle income countries, for example, in Asia, 
because also of the issue of inequalities and basically because um, from September uh, this year onwards we will all be off track. We all have to row in order to make sure that the SDGs are met in our respective countries. The decisions our steering committee took in June also foresee an increased number of civil society organizations, as well as some new constituencies, such as community-based organizations, and some new thinking about how to engage, for example, with the private sector. We also decided that countries should represent 50% at least of our steering committee members. We see these decisions as crucial to enable us to play the role we want to play as a global partnership in the SDG era. Further, the new strategy outlines four behaviours for collaborative action that all partners are encouraged to follow. These behaviours draw on a considerable amount of research and analysis led by our country processes task team, and they are all geared around strengthening national processes and aligning support behind national plans. These behaviours that partners are agreeing to implement are based on the idea also supported by the new SDGs, that states are capable, that they hold the key to their own development to reaching the goal of universal access. Briefly, our, our behaviours are A, enhance government's um, leadership of sector pl uh, 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 planning processes, B, uh, strengthen and use country systems, C, use one information and mutual accountability platform built around a multi-stakeholder, government-led cycle of planning, monitoring and learning, and finally, build sustainable water and sanitation sector financing strategies that incorporate financial data on all three Ts, tax, tariffs, uh, tariffs and transfers, as well as estimates for non-tariff household expenditure. I will not go into more detail at this stage, but we leave it to our other presenters to tell you more and to go into a greater depth in discussing, uh, in discussing the four behaviours. And so to come back to the role of uh, SWA within the context of the SDGs, we believe that within our new strategy, SWA has a clear role to play in publicising the SDGs and in facilitating states' implementation of the SDGs. For example, one of the things that uh, we want to do is to support states in developing their national sustainable development strategies for water and sanitation, where they outline how they want to make sure that in the next 15 years they will meet the goal, the goal and all other related water, sanitation and hygiene targets. Um, and we also want to provide a platform for subsequent follow-up and review of progress regarding the steps taken to achieve uh, the SDGs. You may be well be aware that SWA has, over the past six years, held high-level meetings of ministers of finance, governments uh, 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 lead the process of bringing together a range of stakeholders to set commitments for improving sanitation, water and hygiene. Donors also come to those meetings and also table commitments about the way they will offer support. After a year, we follow up and there is a voluntary process of reporting back. Through this cycle, we have been implementing and continuously improving a monitoring system that has similarities with that which is being envisaged for the follow-up and review of the Sustainable Development Goals. The system that SWA has been building up is a predictable, a robust and an inclusive accountability mechanism that is, as I was saying before, multi-stakeholder, it is also voluntary, it's positive, not punitive, and conducive to peer-to-peer -to -peer learning and exchange, it is partner-driven and subject to regular progress reviews. The midterm review of progress is the summary and consolidation of our partners' annual monitoring of the commitments tabled at the 2014 SWA high-level meeting. The main objective of these commitments is to remove barriers to access, tackle inequalities, improve sustainability, all of which are strongly reflected in the SDGs. In this process, sanitation and water for all is guided by a strong commitment to mutual accountability. The commitments are set by governments together with the main stakeholders in the country. They are closely linked to the context, 
to the capacities, to the priorities um, of the local situation. We have uh, recently published and launched yesterday the results of the latest midterm review. And I do not want to take up too much time in presenting these results, as you can easily find this information on our website. I would like, however, to draw attention to the headlines, which show that 50% of the commitments are well on the way to being met next year, with 10% have, having already been met. Overall, we find the results encouraging, but still more attention needs to be given to finance, alignment, coordination, and we hope that the behaviors I was mentioning to you before uh, may help us to address some of these outstanding issues. We believe the mechanisms we have refined over the last six years, the lessons we have learned, mean that SWA is well placed to serve as a thematic platform for the follow-up and review of the water, sanitation and hygiene targets of the SDGs. I'm by no means meaning that we are perfect, that our work is perfect and that the system we have is perfect. However, we think that it is a basis on which we can evolve, that we can develop, but I think it is a good basis to use uh, to start the process of ensuring accountability, the much needed accountability for reviewing progress regarding the future sustainable development goals. Uh, as I said, we are aware that some changes can be needed to adapt the system, but the future follow-up and review process of the, um, the WASH targets of the SDGs could I think it should build on our experience. We are currently exploring engagement with other partnerships to help build a coherent network of support for the water, sanitation and hygiene related goals. Our decision to extend our membership to include additional mi middle income uh, countries um, will also provide us a more global understanding of the barrier, uh, barriers and challenges in ach achieving universal access to sanitation, to water and hygiene with, as I said, a particular focus on inequalities. We count on our partners the present partners and the future ones, to continue this great adventure of making sure that in 15 years' time, everyone will have access to sanitation, to water, and to hygiene. Thank you so much for your attention. So, Katerina, thank you so much. I realised I made that classic mistake of someone that starts a session that welcomes everyone in the room and forgets to introduce themselves. My name is Amanda Marlin and I'm the coordinator for Sanitation and Water for All. So, really good that you're here today. I'd not to like to ask Heather to come up and make her presentation. And I think she has some slides to show us. Good afternoon, everyone. It's very hard to talk after Katerina because you feel very boring and slow. <laughs> but hopefully it won't be too dull. I, I actually think this is an exciting piece of work. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to figure this out as well. Um, so Katerina has set the stage for us a little bit, talking about the strategy introducing some of these behaviors. And my job now is to drill down a little bit, talk in more detail about what we consider these behaviors to look like, how we all need to start not just doing different things, but thinking differently, behaving differently in order to move toward the SDGs. And I just want to flag the de very deliberate use of the word behavior. So we have taken a cue from our colleagues in hygiene. We're recognizing the fact that change is not easy, that in order to accomplish what we're describing here, we have to be consistent, we have to be thorough, we have to be deep in how we apply this new thinking. Um, not dissimilar to hand washing or wearing your seat belts or flossing your teeth, you know, it's an incremental journey that we're all on together around this. So let's talk a little bit about what we've been proposing through the SWA partnership. So I don't need to belabor this point. We all know the challenges. We've been sitting here for three days talking about the challenges over and over again, and we know that they only get deeper. The bar is higher as we come toward the SDGs. So 
What we also know then is that business as usual is not going to be enough. Looking at the recent Glass report, what we saw was that 85% of the reported WASH aid was still being done on a project by project basis. It's not programmatic, it's not embedded in the country process, it's our individual one-off activities not brought together, not melded in a way that's um, going to get us to the SDGs. That's the old way of doing business. And that approach is not going to build those lasting systems that we're actually trying to look for. And in fact, you know, we can argue that in many ways that undermines the systems that we're trying to develop. So in response, the um, behaviors that we think are going to bring us closer to a systemic change are these four. So Katerina walked through them quickly. Um, what we'll do is go through each of these and then, as Amanda said, we'll have a little bit of a dialogue around them. But what I'll do now is just introduce some of the thinking, a brief definition about what we had in mind around each of these, and then um, we'll talk about what that behavior might look like as we collectively move forward. So behavior one is specifically around enhancing government leadership of a sector planning process. So there's a lot packed in there. We have enhancement, we have government leadership, and we have the, the sector planning process. So we know that government leadership is critical to good sector planning, and in, term, in turn, we know that a strong, cohesive, realistic sector plan is essentially like the beating heart of an efficient and effective service delivery process. So that leadership is needed for what? It's needed to set out the priorities and the policy. It's needed to set the rules and guidelines. And then it's um, very important to directing and coordinating resources, internal and external. And again, we've had a lot of conversation about domestic resource mobilization in the sector recently. And we're, when we talk about partners in this, we're talking about, um, as we heard, the partnership of SWA is reflective of governments, NGOs, now the private sector, um, external development partners. So we're talking very comprehensively about partners. Um, plus, you need leadership to undertake some of that hard scrutiny. You know, if we're talking about accountability, if we're talking about institutional change, you need to demonstrate some leadership to undertake that conversation and to you know, critically assess where you are in terms of progress against the SDGs. The leadership is what's needed um, to establish this regular process. You know, we're talking about a process of planning, assessing, and then replanning in a continual cycle. And it's a leadership that's needed to make that happen and to inspire participation from all the stakeholders. If we're not doing that, we're, again, either dropping the ball or we're undermining the kind of um, process that we're trying to achieve. So what, what does that behavior change look like? What it looks like is that we're actually investing in the process itself. So again, getting away from project by project intervention, we have to think about government's ability to undertake that process. You know, if I think on behalf of USAID, we, we need to show results. We're focused on access. But more and more, what we're recognizing is that for systemic change, we need to actually invest in the local government systems that can undertake that planning process and help us identify where we can best prioritize our resources. So in terms of a, a self-reflection, it means we need to be able to articulate why that is a good investment for US taxpayers in terms of long-term sustainable development. We also need to participate in the process. Um, again, thinking about USAID, okay, we're not always at the table. We're not always there at the JSRs. And again, we're looking as, partly as a result of this process, we're thinking about how to better engage in the sector conversation, how to be at the table, how to exchange more with our colleagues as we move forward in thinking about how to move our resources. Um, I think a third tenant of this is 
when it gets difficult and when the system is not working, don't flee and retreat back to business as usual. Stick it out. You know, we collectively need to stick it out and see how we can make it better rather than just reverting to poor behavior. So don't stop washing your hands. The second behavior that we wanted to talk about was strengthening and using country systems. So this isn't glamorous, but these are the backbone of how we move public resources. We're talking about um, financial management systems, HR management. We're talking about statistics, procurement, contract management. Critical, not really exciting until they work. And then they're very exciting. So for universal access to be achieved, these are the backbone systems. And they're not just necessary at that central level. We need to see them drill down into all the decentralized levels as well. So as long as most of our WASH investment is project-based, we're often bypassing these systems still. We're not working through them. We're working around them because it's faster and easier to fix infrastructure than it is to fix an institution. So the behavior change here is to shift the emphasis to strengthening and using country systems. It looks like a trade-off, again, uh, similar to the planning process. It looks as though we're sort of reneging on our commitment to focus on new access or sustained access, but in fact, this is what gets us to an SDG. This is what helps build a sustainable approach after we're all gone as external partners. The third behavior is about using one information and accountability platform. So to know where to invest and to know how to sustain services, we need to know what works. We need to be building information around the sector and we need to be sharing that information. It needs to be reliable information. So there needs to be a process um, and there needs to be a platform that allows us to all do that. We need to understand where the data gaps are. We need to understand how, who's going to help populate that data. We need to know where to put it. We need to trust each other with our data. And then we need to have a system by which it can be used. So I think you can also start seeing how all these behaviors are integrated and how they're also all predicated on a degree of trust among partners in country. So the change here is about that willingness to share data it's about a willingness to use and build country systems. We don't own that information. That's country information. We know that many of our country partners are building these kinds of monitoring platforms. But unless we're taking the extra effort to help populate them, what's the point? And likewise, if we're not dipping into that data in order to inform ourselves, what's the point? Data for data's sake is not particularly useful. The, the last, we've also heard a lot this week, I think, about financing strategies for the sector. So realistic financing strategies based on service life cycles are critical to making better investment decisions, and they're critical to making sustainability a reality. Thinking about financing not just for your own span of your project activity, but thinking about the perpetuity of a service is a very different way of approaching financing strategies. And it's something that has to be done again at the country level. So a proper plan is going to have to look at all the available sources of funding and make those sensible allocation decisions. And in turn, that means we need to know more about who's putting what money in, into the, the pocket. So that means we need to be more transparent about our um, our funding agreements with government, service providers have to have better financial statements. We need to understand that contribution at the household level. Um, we need to understand consumption better. All of this information base is going to enable government and the stakeholders to direct and monitor the sector investments. We need to collaborate around sector planning, following the government's lead, and be able to draw on all this financing information in order to make that happen. So if we come back and pull this all together, 
Um, as Katerina mentioned, we didn't just whimsically come up with these four behaviors. There was quite a bit of research. We have some papers that I, th I think were available maybe at the table when you came in. So there are a number of case studies that members of SWA have undertaken. We've pulled from those and tried to synthesize through them what, what success might look like and then distilled it into these behaviors, um, which, as Katerina mentioned, are now embraced in the actual strategy of SWA. So de facto, the, the partnership is committing to try and think differently and try and make these kind of fundamental shifts in how we're approaching our, um, our engagement in a country toward achievement of the SDGs. Um, it's important to note that this implies obligations on all sides. Everybody's got a part to play in achieving these behaviors. And again, it's a series of incremental steps. We're not quite there, but we need to keep an eye on the ball while we continue to push ourselves a little bit further against the envelope. It is a framework of trust. Um, there's no easy way to build that. But I think some of these behaviors, once adopted, it becomes like a cascade. The more that we're willing to share, the more that we're willing and able to build a trust among ourselves in country. So we think that through these efforts, and if SWA can be an effective platform for helping people and helping pilot a few countries where we really adopt these behaviors more holistically, we can start assessing whether, in fact, these are fundamental, um, fundamental ways to think about changing the way we do development work collectively. So that was what I needed to tell you about the new behaviors. <laughs> I don't know what Thank you, Heather. So that's really uh, an overview. I'd like to invite now some colleagues to come up and join me here on our sort of panel discussion. Uh, a colleague from uh, Burkina Faso, and then we have three different colleagues from South Sudan who are going to come up. So I'd invite you to join me now. Um, it's, uh, this is an opportunity for us to, uh, to hear a little bit, as, as Heather said, this involves everyone. Everyone's got obligations under this. And I think it's interesting to hear from partners from government, development partners, welcome, and, uh, and from the donor community as well to, uh, to tell us a little bit about this. So Heather gave an overview and gave some context as well. Uh, you'll see, as, as she said, this is, um, these are behaviours that we've given a lot of thought to that are based on some uh, country-level work and some real case studies. And, you know, some of these will be familiar to you. They've grown out of some of the aid effectiveness discussions that then have continued on to development uh, effectiveness discussions. So these are the sort of behaviours that we're, uh, we're talking about. Now, firstly, um, from Burkina Faso. Yes. Uh, Minister Lompo, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to uh, ask my question in English. Mm -hmm. I know you have your uh, translator. So, Minister Lompo, you're Minister for Agriculture, Water Resources, Sanitation, and Food Security. Exactly. Broad for portfolio. We've heard that one of the most important things is to strengthen national leadership. So can you tell us how you've been exercising leadership in your country and bringing together the different partners to support what you have to do on water, sanitation and hygiene? Bien. Alors, merci pour invité. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Ah, comme vous devez le savoir, hein, le Burkina quand même c'est un pays, nous n'allons pas pouvoir atteindre tous les objectifs euh, qui sont assignés. Uh, as you might know, uh, in Burkina Faso, we might not uh, be able to reach all the goals that we had set. Alors c'est pour ça qu'en termes de gouvernance, euh, ce que nous avons fait, 
gouvernance dans le secteur de l'eau et de l'assainissement. Nous avons créé, si vous voulez, des cadres sectoriels de dialogue so, avec l'ensemble des partenaires qui interviennent avec nous. So, when it comes to governance in in water and sanitation, we created um, sectoral framework frameworks well with all the partners we're working with. Parce que nous avons nous avons constaté que euh, si vous voulez les faibles performances de notre secteur de l'eau et de l'assainissement, il y a eu un euh, si vous voulez un diagnostic qui a, qui a été fait. Nous Mais, avons pensé que l'aspect gouvernance de ce secteur mm -hmm. est le plus important. Uh, because uh, we uh, we made an assessment and and we saw that there was poor um, poor governments within uh, water and sanitation. Donc, vous avez vu de pauvres performances. Et qu'est-ce que... Oui, alors, donc, mmh. le sec, la, la mmh. gouvernance du mmh. secteur de l'eau et de l'assainissement, mmh. mmh. c'est vraiment le point central mmh. qui joue sur l'efficacité mmh. mmh. des services de l'eau. Mmh. So, and we saw the, that governance was really crucial when it comes to the efficiency of, of the water and sanitation sector. Mmh. Alors, peut-être ce qu'il faut rajouter également, mm -hmm. c'est que, tenant compte de cela, ce que nous, nous avons fait, c'est que euh, nous sommes dans, vraiment engagés dans les réflexions pour faire la politique nationale de l'eau. Uh, we have really entered into discussions to develop a national water policy. C'est même en cours de développement. Hein? It, it, we are developing that right now. Avec des programmes. With programs. Et y compris donc ce problème de gouvernance. Including the governance issue. Ensuite, nous avons essayé de faire en sorte que dans notre constitution, mm -hmm. nous, pouvons, nous puissions inscrire les droits à l'eau et à l'assainissement. And uh, we had, we ensured that we been able to enshrine the right to water and sanitation in our constitution. Voilà, donc brièvement, voilà, donc c'est des cadres de concertation entre l'ensemble des partenaires mm -hmm. et puis des programmes qui se développent à l'intérieur d'une politique nationale de l'eau qui va être adoptée et les programmes sont déjà il y en a qui sont terminés il y en a ils sont en cours mm -hmm. voilà. so um, framework for discussions with our partners mm -hmm. and, and national programs mm -hmm. for water policies and, uh, some programs have already been carried out other are being carried out right now voilà. merci bien a real demonstration of national leadership by creating the framework for the different partners to come together and exactly as you summarized a plan to get behind so that's an example from Burkina Faso then we have three colleagues here from South Sudan welcome I'm going to speak firstly to Isaac Liabwell you're the undersecretary for the Ministry of Water Resources and Irrigation now It, we were very privileged yesterday. We heard from your minister, Minister Kumba, yesterday at our press briefing. Uh, you were, she was talking about South Sudan, and she spoke very eloquently about the challenges in the country and the large country with challenges uh, in different parts, different nature. Um, and, and yet, you operate within these constraints. Uh, you have to. So, operating within those constraints for your country and bringing together a number of different partners, we've been talking about these behaviours. What are the challenges from a government point of view that you see in terms of acting according to these behaviours? And what do you want from your development partners? Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Amanda. I will start with the challenges mm -hmm. because you introduced me as under secretary of the Ministry of Water Resources and Irrigation. I am Isaac Liabwe, under secretary for water sector in the ministry responsible for electricity ah. and water. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister, for opening the gate for me. And in Africa, one of the difficult things I have uh, learned in the, my short period of 10 years in government is that our institutions are not uh, established, they are not stable. If we want a small government in Africa, we lump big sectors together, 
if we want a big government, we can even dis uh, disaggregate very small factor until you reach there. So, fragmentation is possible, and also creating a bureaucracy is possible. Uh, to move straight forward, when we started in 2005, we started with one challenge and one opportunity. The challenge we were at some level of government with serious fragmentation of our water sector. Rural water supply and sanitation was in a different ministry. Urban water supply and sanitation was in a different ministry. Uh, now as we speak, the rest has come back to one ministry, but urban sanitation is still in a different ministry. So the opportunity we had then, we had started to move during the OLS, Operation Lifeline Sudan, we were having a sector leadership through uh, SRRA, uh, so it was Sudan Rehabilitation and Relief uh, Agency, and then there was a sector leadership through humanitarian wing through UNICEF. This one continued very well. Then before our government was announced in October 2005, we uh, had the government under the government of national unity under Sudan then. We start, start to process the water policy in 2005, May. Then when we came in February, there was fragmentation. So we quickly redressed that by putting up a coordination mechanism through South Sudan Water Sector Steering Committee. Then we accomplished the policy in 2007 and we move quickly into strategic framework to properly detail all the subsectors of the sector. And then we concluded our what is strategic framework. Therefore, we move quickly with that. After the strategic framework, we identified what we need to do to move the sector forward in, in terms of institutional establishment, legal framework, investment needed, and we put that one in place by putting rural work uh, in action and investment plan and urban work uh, uh, investment and implementation plan. Uh, with the, the urban work was held by uh, GIZ and the rural work was with the help of UNICEF. Then now, we come to the challenge. So we managed to pass this state by putting up a robust coordination and we led our sector mm -hmm. by coordinating all the pieces of developmental assistance coming there from development partners. Then when we came here, we were trying to strengthen our system. And then our system were not yet trustworthy by the development partners. So we start by establishing a strong aid management under sectoral ministries. And then you keep your money, we agree on what to do with the money, we do procurement together and we move. And then we revert it back to crisis, the normal phenomena of Africa, that you have to move out of crisis and you revert back to crisis. So there were challenges, but we managed them through coordination. Let mm -hmm. me leave it there for a time being. Thank you very much. So there's the government's perspective from South Sudan. Um, Anka Pen, you're working in South Sudan and representing GIZ. So um, as a donor working in the country, uh, I know that you have a strong commitment to uh, strengthening that national leadership and to this sort of behaviour. But of course the reality for you, and Heather um, you know, very openly alluded to it for her organisation, USIAID, is you have your own constraints for your own agency as well. And you need to, uh, to address both of those. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how you approach overcoming that and being able to align with this sort of behavior. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Anke Peiner. I'm in charge of the uh, GIZ Urban Water and Sanitation Program in South Sudan. I'm there for three years now, and I have made a lot of experiences in these uh, difficult conditions over the past three years. Um, in general, GIZ is working on behalf of the German government. That means that we work within a bilateral government uh, agreement uh, which forces us to use uh, our partner structures in general. 
Yeah? Um, we use either government systems or the agents such as public utilities for water and sanitation services. We are obliged to use these official structures and we also try to enhance the structures when we don't find them uh, on place. Mm -hmm. um, Isaac has explained already that GIZ was heavily embarked on supporting planning documents such as the urban investment plan um, in South Sudan, such as the water strategic framework and also the water bill. Yeah. Um, more practical, on the side of the structures that were established in South Sudan, the program was admitted by the IMEC process, which is the official um, structure to admit programs working in South Sudan. And we also have developed a national steering structure um, in cooperation with the KFW investment system. But there are a lot of difficulties that we face, even though that always sounds very positive. So, I was going to ask you to tell us about the difficulties yeah, as well as so the Yeah, so that is coming now. Um, we started with a multi-level approach that GIZ is using in a lot of different countries as well, where we support sector reform process and at the same time also establish services on the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, in conflict-affected states such as South Sudan since December 2013, um, due to political reasons, certain levels of government uh, are not considered uh, suitable partners anymore. That means that we have to limit our work to lower levels of government or only to the agents, such as the utilities, to improve service delivery on the ground. Mm -hmm. That means for South Sudan that the urgently needed capacities on the national level are heavily neglected for the time being, and uh, that also the national leadership is neglected from our side. Mm -hmm. yeah. Emergency interventions, which are now actually um, heavily supported yeah, due to the reasons we all understand, are mostly bypassing national wash sector structures, mm -hmm. per se. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit the difficulties at the moment. And then there's also one thing, even though we face these difficulties, uh, when it comes to the rationale of uh, investing in these kind of countries, we have to build up local structures. Mm -hmm. And there we always also focus on national government structures or the agents. So in South Sudan, we actually establish service structures on the ground, mm -hmm. which is quite time consuming and um, let's say quite difficult regarding the capacity gap that we find in these kind of countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for being so open with us. I think that's really helpful. And then Lillian, I would like to call on you. Lillian O'Query, you're the Chief of WASH, Water Sanitation and Hygiene in UNICEF, based in South Sudan. So you represent UNICEF in South Sudan, and therefore you're part of the group of partners working together. So tell me, when you look at these behaviours, what do they say to you? And what sort of challenges do you think they pose for change? Heather said, we all have to change our behaviour for someone like UNICEF, someone, a group, <laughs> an agency like UNICEF. OK. Um, UNICEF has got two um, um, sections where they, they work both in emergency and they also work in development. Mm -hmm. We also work with the government at all levels. We work with the state government, we also work with the national government, and at the county level. So when we look at the enhancing government uh, leadership for the sector, this is what UNICEF tries to do. It might be difficult in some, t some ways, but this is what we are trying to do. When we do our program, every year we do the annual work plan with the government. We look at the priorities. We, look at, we also invite our NGO partners. So we look at the whole priority. In, um, in emergency, UNICEF is the lead agency mm -hmm. for the WASH cluster. So this brings all the WASH clusters together. And we not forget the, the government leadership. So even if we are the lead agency, we always invite the government so that at least they give us their perspective. After all, they are supposed to be leading, not the NGOs. So we try and ensure that there's a government element, both at the state and also at the national level. When it comes to strengthening the use of country systems, as you know, the country systems are very weak at the moment. So what we do is to try and advocate so that systems are used. We've got WIMS, which is um, information management system, so that we get the data and we ensure that all the um, partners 
working in UNICEF do have some reliable data. But this has not been easy because of the current conflict. But we cannot give up on that. So we are trying to inject, you know, advocate for more funding on the, to strengthen systems. But at the moment, the problem is that most of the funding is going to emergency. Mm -hmm. And they are forgetting about the development side. And this is one critical issue that will happen when there's no more. The other type, the other development will have gone down. And most of the money that has been um, implemented, the money that had been used for spent on development will now, you know, go to waste. So this is what we are doing. Using, making sure that there's transparency. When we have our wash cluster, we make sure that, okay, what are the funding levels that we have? Who has got what? And we have the three W's, who does what, where, and with what funding. Um, building sustainable water sanitation sector financing strategies, this is something which we are still grappling with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Again, thank you so much for being so open and uh, for acknowledging that uh, despite your best efforts, it's not easy uh, always, but there are some areas uh, where there are positives. Um, I very much liked what you said, uh, you know, for example, in terms of the information Sometimes it's a struggle, etc. But you don't give up. I think that's you know that was again one of the main messages from Heather. Um, it's it's easy. I think if if applying these behaviours is challenging, it's easy to go back to other other behaviours. And uh, I think we have to work against that. Um, I'm going to ask if you would be so kind to stay with me. Uh, it's nice to have some company up here, even though we have very bright lights uh, shining at us. But I want this to be a discussion of all of us, um, and uh, I, I'd be glad if you could stay with me for that. Um, there are a few more people here that I, I can see that I would like to call on. One in particular, and I think another country whose experience is very interesting for us, is Madagascar. And we are really very honoured to have the Honourable Minister Juanita Noamananjara, who is joining us here, the Minister for Water, Sanitation and Hygiene. Um, I'm more than happy. It's easiest if you, if you speak from the floor, if that suits you. Yeah? Okay. We need a microphone. Thank you. So, Honourable Minister, um, I'm aware, so first of all, can I say that you are Minister for Water, <coughs> Sanitation and Hygiene. That's unusual that there's a ministry for those, uh, those issues. I think it really speaks to the recognition of the importance of those in Madagascar. Now, you've just developed a sustainable wash services plan coupled with a sector-wide approach. So, what are the next steps that your government will take to ensure that that plan is implemented? And what are the behaviours that you'd be expecting from your development partners? Oui, je vous remercie beaucoup pour euh, cette question. Vous nous excusez déjà euh, par la voix qui est un peu rock euh, du fait que... Euh, euh, J'ai un peu euh, une laryngite, je crois. Donc, euh, pour l'approche sectorielle ou SWAP, comme on dit, qui appuie la mise en place d'une stratégie de pérennisation de services de l'eau, de l'assainissement et de l'hygiène, un task force a été euh, créé à Madagascar donc en février 2015. Ce task force a un rôle d'assurer la coordination des activités afin de pouvoir doter en ressources WASH tous les intervenants à tous les niveaux. Cela... Well, I, I want to thank you to, to give me the possibility to talk. As you notice, I'm losing my voice a bit. I hope that you, you forgive me. Um, when it comes to the sector-wide approach, it is built on the setting up of a sustainable uh, strategy for water um, 
sanitation and health services and a task force was created in February 2015 to coordinate uh, activities in order to make resources available, washed resources available to all stakeholders at all levels. Cela se fera cela se fera sous la direction du ministère de l'eau, de l'assainissement et de l'hygiène et selon un plan et une organisation bien ficelée. Le groupe de travail élaborera donc le concept d'une approche sectorielle en WASH applicable à Madagascar, c'est-à-dire en tenant compte de nos réalités et de nos possibilités techniques. And, and that will be done under the umbrella of the uh, Ministry for Water, Sanitation and Hygiene, according to a, a solid and well-tailored uh, uh, plan and organization. And a, a working group will um, design an approach, uh, a sectorial approach for, for WASH, an approach that will be uh, suitable to, to Madagascar, that is to say that will take into account our own realities and our own technical possibilities. Ce projet sera soumis en appréciation des, affecte, des effecteurs au niveau périphérique et révisé en ce sens avant sa mise en œuvre. Une bonne adéquation des ressources et des compétences nous permettra d'assurer ces travaux et la mise en place d'un mécanisme de suivi indépendant nous facilitera son évaluation. Well, we, we think that a, a good match of, of resources and, and competences will make it possible for us to carry out that, that work and set up a, a, a a mechanism, an independent monitoring mechanism that will facilitate uh, its assessment and evaluation. Le ministère de l'eau, de l'assainissement et de l'hygiène aura un rôle de concepteur, régulateur au niveau central et effectué au niveau périphérique au même niveau que les autres acteurs du secteur privé ou associatif. On attend alors de toutes les parties prenantes de s'aligner à la politique et à la stratégie fixée par le ministère de l'eau, de l'assainissement et de l'hygiène. Que tous ces efforts soient coordonnés par le ministère pour assurer une meilleure efficacité dans nos activités communes. Well, um, the, the, the Ministry uh, for Water, Sanitation and Hygiene will act as a designer uh, as well as a regulator at, at the central level and at the local and regional level it will be an actor just as any actor of the private uh, sector or the, the voluntary sector. And we are expecting all, uh, our, all the shareholders to align themselves to the Uh, the policy and the strategy that has been defined by, by the Ministry. And we want all efforts to be coordinated by the Ministry in order to be more efficient uh, as we are developing our activities. Ainsi, cette approche, ainsi cette approche sectorielle permettra d'éviter le chevauchement des activités et une meilleure coordination. Le task force comprend d'autres entités, et notamment le ministère des Finances et du Budget, le ministère de l'Intérieur et de la Décentralisation, et les structures régionales, comme les directeurs régionaux de l'eau, de l'assainissement et de l'hygiène, et les communes. Le représentant des Nations Unies sera l'UNICEF et il y aura le groupe des bailleurs de fonds qui sera représenté par la BAD et il y aura également l'existence des ONG internationales et nationales il y aura la société civile et également le secteur privé donc voilà à peu près ce qui encadre ce, ce système pour que nous puissions aller de l'avant et 
avancer dans ce changement que nous, euh, euh, nous voyons euh, important pour la réussite de secteur. Merci. Yes, the, the, um, uh, we, yeah, sorry. It is, yeah, it is the, um, this uh, sectorial, uh, this sector-wide approach will make it possible for us to avoid uh, du duplicating activities and it will enable a better coordination. And the task force that I talked about will include other um, shareholders, um, stakeholders, sorry, and particularly the, the, the Ministry for Finance and, and Budget, the Ministry of the Interior and of Decentralization, as well as other regional structures, such as the regional directions for water, sanitation and hygiene, the municipalities. Um, uh, UNICEF will be our representatives as far as the United Nations are concerned, And the, as far as the donators are concerned, we will work together with the African Development Bank. Uh, we will also uh, cooperate with, the, uh, with international NGOs, national NGOs, the civil society and the, the private sector. And that is the framework that we want to, to set up in order to, to go forward to implement this change that we believe is important for us to, to succeed in this sectorial, sector-wide approach. Mm -hmm. Merci bien pour cette contribution de la part de Madagascar. So, I, re I really do think we've been, you know, so privileged to have three voices from government explaining the, the national leadership and the systems in place and the frameworks they're establishing. We really, we're really serious when we say that national systems, national government leadership is at the heart of what we're doing. And then other sector partners, we hear such willingness to behave in a way that supports that system. Now, Honourable Minister, you mentioned your association with the African Development Bank. And I know we have a colleague here, uh, Jochen uh, Rudolph, from the African Development Bank. So I'm wondering if you would like to um, also comment on these behaviours that we've been talking about. We've heard quite a lot about the first couple, a little bit about the monitoring. Maybe you would also... I'm, I'm interested in your comments in all the behaviours, but I'm also particularly interested in this, how do we strengthen financial services, financial strategies, etc. Up to you, though, as to which aspect you'd like to speak to. Uh, yes, thank, thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Uh, the African Development Bank uh, aspires to be the continent's leading development institution, supporting uh, inclusive and green growth. And uh, the bank's water and sanitation department is currently supporting 64 projects in uh, 38 of Africa's 54 countries. And uh, doing that uh, has a financial volume of about 2.5 billion euros. Um, in addition, as, as many may know, uh, the bank hosts the African Water Facility, a project preparation facility, that is active in, in 24 countries. Um, the AFDB is, is very proud to be an active member of the SWA partnership. Uh, we greatly appreciate the intellectual leadership and the effective advocacy that SWA provides on a global level with a very strong African representation. The focus on, on behaviors um, comes at the right time. As most uh, development practitioners will probably agree, the results of our work depend to a large extent on the cooperative behavior that a multitude of stakeholders adopt. In other words, as we are as we're doing, or are we doing things right can just be as, as, as important as having the right objectives. Um, the, the four behaviors for collective actions 
um, and uh, sustainable results are familiar as they are firmly built on the development effectiveness agenda uh, that came out of Paris and Accra. On the other hand, an honest self-assessment quickly shows that even 10 years after Paris and Accra, uh, a lot remains to be done. Um, I'm not now delving into uh, the financing bubble that is in orange, but <laughs> I would like to just to point two challenges uh, out, of, out of many. Um, one of them, government leadership and sector planning. It's often challenged by crises that lead to a rapid succession of decision makers that uh, weaken sector institutions and that can even destroy physical infrastructure. Currently, 16 out of 54 African countries have a country policy and institutional assessment rating that qualifies them as fragile. Many more are at risk of entering into fragility or sliding back into it. As a development bank, we need to give much more patience and resources to allow governments uh, to, to assume the leadership in sector planning, even if they're currently going through fragile situations. This should be uh, given priority over our own time frames, which is sometimes difficult, and our disbursement targets. Um, the use of country systems, the second bullet there on the, on the wall, um, is another behavior that seems at first obvious, but then it turns out often to be anything but that. Um, very often country systems, even in countries where significant resources have been spent on to develop them and to strengthen them, are not used. They, to collectively agree on changing this would greatly contribute to more effective and transparent decision making and resource allocation. The AFDB has taken the engagement to increasingly implement programs as part of programmatic approaches. In the water and sanitation sector, the, program, the programmatic approach is currently applied in Ethiopia, Tanzania and Uganda, as well as in a number of other countries. So these are my observations, yeah. but unfortunately I skipped the last one. <laughs> <I> <laughs> Well, it's a tricky one. I think, I, think, um, I think that says something about the fact that, you know, these are, it's not easy. Uh, we, we have genuine aspirations to achieve this and to act in this way. Some perhaps we're, uh, we're further down the track on, but these challenge us to change our behaviour. That's what it's all about. You know, I was a bit demanding of my colleagues when I said, can you stay with me here? Because actually it gets a bit tiring standing up here and there are very bright lights. So I'm going to let you take your seats again. Because we're still going for a little bit more discussion. But thank you. Um, some, as I said before, um, you know, we want, to, we want to give a chance for, uh, for you to, to make some comments as well. It's not so much question and answer, but any observations that you would like to share as well, or any experiences. And I think that, you know, some of the messaging that I'm hearing is that, yes, we all aspire to this, but, and, and we're, we're doing a lot of things to try to support this, but there are some challenges. So I'm particularly interested in hearing from anyone that wants to say something about what you see as some of the challenges in behaving in this way, changing our behavior in this way, and what are some of your suggestions or things that you might have tried doing that you think have helped you move uh, towards these behaviors. So anyone, we have some uh, microphones, please. Thank you. Uh, Lotte Feuerstein from the Water Integrity Network. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big fan of, of the work of Sanitation and Water for All, and I think those are very valid um, behaviors. What I'm missing a bit is, um, I think, actually, um, a lot of this question about using country systems the trade-off it boils down to is not so much whether you invest in the country systems or in 
service infrastructure, but I think one very important trade-off is about accountability and about domestic accountability of donors, where, which makes them wanting to reduce fiduciary risk mm -hmm. and strengthening accountability systems in the countries where they work, which would require them to use country systems because only when governments really deliver the services and handle the, the development funds that come in, that is when the citizens can hold them to account. So this is my first point. And a quick second one is, I think when you dive into a bit more this domestic accountability in developing countries, I mean, the local level plays a crucial role, especially in the water sector, which is a sector which uh, works in a decentralized manner. So I think there we need to look a lot more, because the accountability you talk about in that, mm -hmm. in that green bullet, it's, it's a lot between from government, donor government to... Um, to country governments or recipient country governments. Mm -hmm. But I think that the line of accountability within these government systems, so how can intergovernmental transfer mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. be transparent and accountable? And how can these uh, local governments first have the capacity to really manage services and mm -hmm. funds and how can we support their constituencies to hold them to account? These are, I think, key questions. Thank you. I think they're very important points that you make. And as the financing discussion increasingly, we are all, uh, I think, involved in discussions about a move away from thinking about recipient governments and donor governments and increasing focus on domestic resource mobilisation, then you're reminding us that that accountability within country for that, that spending is important. Thank you. I think there was another comment within that same row. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dinesh uh, Suna. I'm from the Ecumenical Water Network of uh, World Council of Churches from mm -hmm. Geneva. Um, I'm a big fan of the work of Katerina de Albuquerque uh, during her previous tenure, and therefore it's in the very right hand. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> I just missed uh, a little about the SWA is what is the mandate of the SWA? Because previously uh, the, the special rapporteur earlier had a mandate uh, to really the governments and the civil society, everybody looked up to and listened to her. And now about 90 odd uh, collaborators have joined this effort. Is it a civil society uh, initiative? Is it, will it be called as a platform, as an NGO? Or how as a faith-based organizations who are already engaged in water sanitation uh, works, uh, how we can find a, a role to strengthen these processes. So uh, the first question is probably about a little clarity on its mandate so that it's all the more effective and others are also accountable as one of your third point is all about accountability. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to give a quick response to that and, and I'd love the chance to talk a little further about it. It's very interesting that you talk about mandate because um, I think especially as we, we're looking at the Sustainable Development Goals and New Sustainable uh, Development Agenda, one of the things I find interesting is that I think perhaps now we're moving into a, a different era and uh, less about mandates and more about people voluntarily stepping up and contributing to uh, the development agenda. So indeed, sanitation and water for all is one of the things we often talk about is it's more like a movement of people coming together, like-minded people. Really, SWA is all about people that sign up to the vision of sanitation, water and hygiene for all people, <laughs> everywhere, all the time. So it's a very different um, way of working. It's a very different sort of uh, partnership uh, and we, we feel, though, that its, uh, its strength is that voluntary nature and people coming together and agreeing together that this is how we want to work together. We believe that these are the behaviours. As Heather said, we're really embracing these behaviours as a, a movement of people that want to achieve sanitation and water for all. We're embracing these behaviours and saying, this is how we're going to work together. 
I think there was a question here and one here, and then unfortunately I'm going to have to round up because I want to give my colleague Everest uh, a moment to, uh, to say a few words at the end. Okay. Uh, Mudawi, focal point from Sudan, or SAWA, SWA. Uh, I have uh, some observation here on collaborative behaviors. And I think all of this should be, uh, we, we need to build something like uh, values around all these as a sectors. If we don't agree upon the values, uh, then uh, the, the, the different partners have their own interest and the conflict interest will be stopped. And if you want to look at any circle of this, if we minimize the conflict of interest, then we can reach the, the agreements how we can work together. Because if you, you look to the, the different entities there are working together, if they lose the values of the, of the sector, then everything will be collapsed. So I think that the all over of this, we need to build the values of the sector and should be a part of this. And the values will be, uh, for example, trust, uh, uh, transparency, uh, uh, working with each other in, 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 in uh, dignity, whatever. And these values will guide all of us at, at the end to reach our final mm -hmm. goals. Uh, Maybe I will, I will uh, jump a bit uh, to respond to some questions uh, mm -hmm. uh, regarding our, our uh, experience in Sudan. Uh, SAWA in, in Sudan is composed of the government, uh, uh, NGOs, national NGOs, um, uh, UN partners, and all of us work together in one forum that to ensure that uh, all the people are in one page and the voices of all of us will be in, 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 united together so that we, we in voluntary we work together to have one setup of uh, agreed upon plans and strategies and we move to have a collective uh, vision to, to go upstairs for the, the, the solution of our problems. And this will be replicated not only on Sudan, maybe in all SWA, because this is one of the the, the issues that we all of us agreed upon within these six years. It is not uh, government, it is not UN, it is not NGOs, it is all of the sector partners work together to reach the, the agreed upon uh, results. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, very much. And uh, Sylvia. Yes, I'm Sylvia Gaya, the Chief of Watch for UNICEF in Madagascar. And uh, I mean, I, I think that this ambition, uh, vision, I would say, it's, it's really great to have, but we need to probably start by getting some digestions and some internalizing process. Mm. And I think that one of these internalization uh, would uh, necessarily go through the fact that we need uh, to accept that if we really want to strengthen systems, strengthen government leadership, because we are all of us working in, in, in places where this is not really uh, at its uh, optimal stage. It, we need to accept that this costs um, money. This needs resources. Mm -hmm. And um, we need to probably start thinking in a, in a long uh, way run, rather than thinking in the immediate number of people, etc. We need to complement this and couple with some resources design to strengthen the systems that we are aiming here. And most importantly, I think that in terms of the other partners of the sanitation and water for all that are not the governments themselves, but are the other partners like UNICEF, like the uh, donors, like the NGOs, everyone who is around, I think that we should build um, a framework for accountability and, and find a way that at least when we are um, doing the internal process of revision, we ask ourselves, how good are we on this? Because at the end of the story, we cannot put all the accountability in the government. They cannot coordinate the sector if there is no one to be coordinated in the room, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, the partners, we need to, to embrace this and to do an auto-assessment and, and to mm -hmm. enter into an accountability network, um, uh, framework so that we assure that we are coming towards this direction. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to invite Everest to come up. He's going to say a little bit uh, about what comes next. We said that 
SWA has embraced these behaviours, we're going to have a few occasions, a few moments in the coming months to be able to discuss these and put them into practice. A partnership meeting at the end of the year, a ministerial meeting early next year, a high-level meeting of Ministers of Finance in October next year in Washington. Everest, talk to us about uh, what comes next. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, some very quick and uh, some very quick point. My name is Evaris Kwasikomla, Senior Advisor at Water and Sanitation at UNICEF in New York. Uh, some, some very quick and uh, general point for the discussion uh, we hear today. And thank for um, uh, the Minister from um, Madagascar, also Burkina, for um, their insight for the discussion. Um, I was trying a bit to see how I can better translate uh, the behavior uh, in French. And, uh, you know, I come up with something very, very good. I think that we can, we can still use. Um, so what, uh, what I wrote down is, you know, is very, very simple. Is um, the, the whole title should be uh, how basically will be um, comment est-ce qu'on peut améliorer uh, la manière de construire les systèmes, amélioration de la manière de construire les systèmes. Parce que, in French, if you say behavior, it's like comportement, it's more insulting. So, it's better to say comment on améliore la manière de travailler. It is more soft. So, this is what I just want, I want to say before I move forward. Um, some of the key points for the behavior, like you can see, one thing I capture is like it's a piano. Uh, this piano has more four keyboard, and instead of having you know 64, but they, they have four keyboard, and you can play which one you want. And what we saw from the experience of the countries, um, there's one play, another is not play, or some of two are play, and other are not play. And maybe the African development is playing only one, and the South Sudan is playing two. But how we can bring all them together? is something that SWA will be doing in the coming, in the coming month. Uh, so, uh, very concrete action. Uh, African development say the, the, behavior is, the behavior come at the right time. Uh, and also, there's one fundamental point that is made is that we need much more patience in planning also how we engage uh, uh, the government. So some of the key points that I captured during the discussion is um, implementing the four behavior uh, is totally fundamental. We need to do it. It's what everybody is saying, but we need some flexibility as well. And like we see in the beginning, Katarina point also had a presentation, we cannot do the business as we are doing uh, many years be, be before. We need to change. There's need to have a, a, mind, a mindset. So. Um, the second point that we hear very, uh, very effectively, the issue of accountability, how we can be also accountable, and also how aid can be more effective and all partners have confidence to improve efficiency. It means that the issue of accountability should come very clearly and also how we can, you know, the, the, last, the last keyboard of the behavior is the, how we can mobilize more domestic resources also key. Uh, the monitoring, we talk about monitoring, how we can better use uh, the national system. And the point is that if you want to use the national system, the national system needs to be strengthened so that it can perform the work that has been done. And there's a lot of work, you know, SW will be doing in the coming, in the coming months, how to unpack the whole behavior, make them that they can be measurable. If you have the indicator, you can measure, and then you can take people more accountable. This is what we'll be doing in the coming year. So we need also at the country level, like Lillian say, and also like uh, our colleague from Madagascar say, how uh, we can make sure that we mainstream the behavior in our procedure, in our organization, so that it can be something that we can regularly use. It's very important. This is what you say. Uh, also, how we can encourage other countries which are not part of the system, you know, adopting the, the main behavior are very fundamental. Those are the key points that I capture for the discussion. Um, many people used to tell me I'm, I'm, I'm a fidel. Fidel in French is like 
people you can trust. So I hope you trust me on all those kind of recommendations. Um, the next step, basically, for, for SWO side, what are the key milestones? Uh, one, is, one key milestone is the Sanitation and Water for All partnership uh, meeting in November, where there will be more discussion on how the indicator related to behavior have been unpacked. I think this is one point. And the second one is um, how we are going, uh, you know, the, the sanitation and water for all uh, level commitment dialogue, uh, including in the first quarter of next year to have certain minister dialogue and more or less at the end of the year, uh, the last quarter having the, the certain minister dialogue. But between all those, there are a lot of events that we will be trying to popularize the, the behavior and also the way that we unpack them. Thank you very much, Amanda. Yeah, there is. <laughs> so you had the soft, beautiful version from Everest, and you've had the hardline behaviours from the Anglophones. Um, but this is what we're signing up for. This is really the way we want to see the future and, and our cooperation and our work together. So thank you so much for joining us, for your comments, uh, and thank you very, very much to... Uh, uh, the, the colleagues from the countries, our ministerial uh, colleagues uh, and other development partners for sharing their insights into this. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. <laughs>